Our speaker tonight is Mr. Trey Dimsdale. Trey Dimsdale is the current executive director of the Center for Religion, Culture, and Democracy and serves as counsel for the First Liberty Institute, where he leads legacy planning and foundation outreach initiatives. Prior to joining the team, he was the director of program outreach at the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty, where he directed many of the internationally ranked think tank's most notable initiatives. Trey has spoken in a variety of settings, including the European Parliament and international conferences. Additionally, his writing has appeared in the Washington Times, Rel Religion and Liberty Transatlantic, and Public Discourse. Mr. Dimsdale holds bachelor's degrees in history and political science, as well as a JD from the University of Missouri, Kansas City. He also holds a master's degree in theological ethics and is currently pursuing a PhD from the Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. He was a 2019 National Review Institute Regional Fellow and is a member of the Philadelphia Society, the Federalist Society, and the State Bar of Texas. He also serves as a research fellow at the Ethics and, at the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention, an associate fellow at the Center for Enterprise, Markets, and Ethics in Oxford, United Kingdom. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Trey Dimsdale. Thank you. All right, um, thank you guys for uh, spending a, um, um, an evening here uh, to come and talk about Tocqueville. Um, the, the talk that I'm delivering tonight uh, before we begin our larger discussion is on the um, question of, of um, rights proliferation. And um, so we will we'll jump into that and then hopefully have a robust discussion the French Revolution of February 1848 brought the corrupt and incompetent reign of King Louis Philippe to an ignominious end, and with it the end of the not even 30-year Bourbon Restoration. The months leading up to the revolution were tense, but not filled with violence and rioting. Rather, a series of partisan banquets among the elite provided a more polite setting for advancing the political debates disguised as dinner speeches. To the great frustration of Alexis de Tocqueville, then serving in the Chamber of Deputies, there was no real concern in the government that these banquets might present a threat to the government. On January the 29th, 1848, he warned his colleagues in a speech to the chamber that the nation was sleeping on a volcano. He was right. On February the 23rd, 1848, less than one month later, Prime Minister Francois Guizot was compelled to resign and the next day saw the abdication of the citizen king. The July monarchy had been a constitutional monarchy with a legislature elected to function accordingly, but the months following the fall of King Louis Philippe were somewhat chaotic as a new constitution was crafted. It did not take long for what had been had been crowds of curious onlookers and malcontents rather than rebels to begin staging demonstrations and to make demands on the new government. In response to previously unaddressed demands for electoral reform, the new constitution would eventually be France's first to provide for universal male suffrage. But other social problems were pressed upon those responsible for the new constitution, including crushing levels of unemployment and the poverty that resulted from it. With thousands of unemployed men in Paris, loud support for a new ministry of work in the new republic gained momentum. Given the distribution of governmental responsibilities among existing ministries, such a new ministry would necessarily be social rather than focused on economic policies impacting employment. The mere existence of such a new ministry as proposed by activists would signal, quote, that the state explicitly recognized social well-being or at least social protection and amelioration among its responsibilities. In the context of contemporary debate, this, rec this recognition would mean that the revolution had been a socialist one, so the, pro the proposal was understandably controversial. Tocqueville recognized this, and in his impassioned speech to the Constituent Assembly on the proposed constitution concerning the right to work, delivered in session on September the 12th, 1848, he argued against enshrining a right to work in the constitution of the new republic. 
The speech is notable for addressing a conflict between two competing conceptions of the meaning of human rights. Tocqueville defended the classical historical understanding as he opposed the constitutional codification of a right to work against a new reoriented understanding of rights that is inherited, inherent in the socialist proposal for a, mini, a new ministry of work and the state's assumption of responsibility for social well-being, which would represent the first such provision in a French constitution. Every right guaranteed or granted for or recognized for one individual represents a corresponding restraint on the freedom of others by the imposition of a duty or an obligation. As more rights claims are recognized legally or socially, more constraints on the freedom of others necessarily follow. Tocqueville rightly identified in this speech that the creation of a general, absolute, irresistible right to work would impose a duty upon the state to guarantee a job for every worker who seeks employment. Flowing from this comes, according to Tocqueville, a long chain reaction of unintended consequences, both economic and social, that are politically and economically destabilizing. The creation of this right would impose an obligation on the state that is not within the purview of the state's proper concerns, which Tocqueville never enumerates. He does recognize that in America, government is both absent and passive, as contrasted with the governments of Europeans who believe they are establishing liberty through governments that assume social powers. Classical jurisprudence defines a right in relation to just action, which involves an inherent moral claim. Later critics of this definition have objected that the attendant legal duty associated with a rights claim is not, in fact, a moral restraint, but a pragmatic one. And it is, in the words of American legal theorist and Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., quote, nothing but a prediction of the judgment of a court. Rights and duties are not grounded, then, in anything other than the pronouncements of courts, which can be directed by legislatures and constitutions. On this view, rights, duties, and the actions associated with each are pragmatic and rational rather than moral in any sense of the word. The result of the 1848 debates in the French legislature was a compromise. There was new, no new ministry of work, but the legislature did create a new commission to study the issue, and in the century and a half since his speech, Tocqueville's position has not prevailed. The classical conception of rights advocated by Tocqueville clearly defines the parameters of a legitimate right that deserves legal recognition and protection. Over time, similar well-meaning efforts across the West have further compromised the integrity of the concept of rights in pursuit of expanding freedom and protections for individuals who are, who are members of narrowly defined groups. This has ultimately created an inflation of rights claims that has paradoxically resulted in a decline of freedom due to competing rights claims and expanded government regulations. Further, this has all occurred inside a political structure dependent on a classical conception of rights, the modern nation state. The national form is the indispensable instrument for democratic self-government. It is predicated, at least in part, on the classical conception of rights that clearly defines the parameters of a legitimate rights claim. The well-meaning attempts to address the pressing problem of poverty and the myriad, myriad corollary social problems by the socialist faction of 1848 France unintentionally undermined one of the most important underlying assumptions that has allowed the modern nation state to take shape. Rights are one of the most important and most basic building blocks of the law and consequently the structure of public and private life. It is good to both recognize and respect legitimate rights claims of individuals as the vehicles that create and define the contours of liberty, but there is now a cultural propensity, quote, to frame nearly every social controversy as a clash of rights. Almost anything related to personal autonomy or the integrity of individual concepts of identity is framed in terms of rights. The language of rights is rigid and absolute. Once a right is recognized, there is no more space for productive dialogue. Any future compromise or accommodation will involve an abrogation or detraction of a once vested right. 
This phenomenon, commonly referred to as rights inflation or rights prolifer proliferation, has led to conflicting and overlapping rights claims that often make illegitimate demands on others and result, paradoxically, in an overall decline in freedom and intensified social conflict. There are two major con contributors to rights inflation. One is a lack of technical clarity about the definition of a human right, which leads to laws and judicial decisions that also lack clarity. Some claims are recognized as rights that should be recognized as some other type of legitimate legal claim, but not a right with all the intended and unintended consequences that such recognition entails. The other is a lack of coherent principled cons consensus with regard to the philosophical and moral aspects of rightly identifying legitimate rights claims. There are three aspects of the classical conception of a right. The conception of the right that to Alexis de Tocqueville um, defended in his speech in, in, in 1848 in the Chamber of Deputies. A single rights claim asserts a three-term relation involving a right holder, a duty bearer, and a required action or omission. Crucially, the right holder and the duty bearer are individuals in this scheme, and the required action or omission is imposed upon the duty bearer. Rights create benefits and burdens to the individual rather than to groups. Even when an individual enjoys a legitimate right because of membership in a particular group, it is not the individual's identity as a group member that creates the entitlement. The ancient world had no concept of the individual, no concept of groups of individuals, and therefore no concept of individual liberty or human rights. This emerged with the rise of Christianity and influenced the evolution of the concept of rights that is common both to the civil law as well as Anglo-American common law. It is, the fact of the individual's, it is the fact of the individual's membership in the group, for example, a group of descendants that have a right to inherit, upon which the basis of a claim of right is formed. The individual has rights among other individuals rather than as an individual with a particular identity. The same is true, too, for duty bearers. Every individual who is not the right holder bears an identical duty to act or not with regard to the right holder's rights. There is no common feature that binds that group other than the fact that they do not hold the right that creates the duty that they all bear. The difference is, to be certain, a subtle one, but it is crucial for understanding what is entailed in a rights claim. It is therefore improper to think of rights as anything but personal and individuated. They attach to persons and not things, ideas, groups, or classes. Even institutional rights spring from the free association of individuals, and the law of corporations creates the legal fiction that some of these free associations may enjoy the legal status of persons. Those rights are still personal and individual, but applicable to an institution via a legal mechanism, a legal fiction that makes it possible. The rise of this concept of rights is traceable to the 15th century. Lawyers and philosophers had already posited that fundamental rights ought to protect individual agency and that the final authority of any association or group is to be found in its members. The Christian moral claim that all souls are equal in dignity eventually translated into a social claim for equal individual rights. Those individuals may, from time to time, join groups voluntarily or be a part of them by birth, profession, or operation of law, but even in those contexts, they are still individuals among other individuals who act to give the group a will and the ability to act. There are certain types of claims that sail under the flag of rights that are not, in fact, rights. American legal scholar Wesley Hofeld developed a widely respected and accepted systematization of these various concepts published as fundamental legal conceptions as applied in ju judicial reasoning in 1917. Only what Hofeld calls a claim right strictly fits this three-term definition stated above. Other types of claims, like powers, for example, function in some respects like rights and are often colloquially described as a right. An example is the legal power um, uh, for, uh, of a legal power is the power of a property owner to transfer his or her property. 
There are legal mechanisms that enable the transfer, and there may be legal provisions that limit or define that power. There is no person, however, entitled to receive a transfer of that property, and the property owner has no obligation to transfer it at all. In Tocqueville's France, the creation of a generalized and individuated right to work would have made every French citizen a right holder. But who would have become the duty bearer and what would have been the required action or omission, omission entailed in the creation of this right? Leaving aside the question of whether the content of such a right is legitimate, the framing of this solution to a social problem in terms of a right presents several immediate problems. First, duty, right holders and duty bearers are, in, were, are individuals within the classical definition of rights, but the constitutional articulation of the right would make a non-person, the Republic of France, the duty bearer regarding this right. Second, recognition of this right imposes an obligation to undertake action to provide employment on the state as duty bearer. Tocqueville recognized this immediately. And he says, quote, the state must, would then must endeavor to give a job to every worker who seeks employment. Groups cannot be duty bearers because they can only act through the individuals that constitute them. So, in a sense, each French citizen would be both an individual right holder and a collective duty bearer regarding the same obligation. They would be, in technical Hofeldian language, both the object and the subject of the same right. The same impulse to solve a social conflict or problem has led countries to recognize myriad legal rights in their laws or constitutions. In 2001, Greece amended its constitution to create a right to access the internet in language that explicitly obligates the state to facilitate it. This individuated right then makes each Greek citizen an individual right holder and, by virtue of being a Greek citizen, a duty bearer with reference to the same right. Different people have different intuitions about rights due to religious, cultural, and other differences. Anthropological assumptions regarding natural inequality, for example, have driven the relations among persons in unju to un unjust social arrangements, like the ancient Indian caste system or American chattel slavery. Even within a system like the West today, which is generally oriented toward just social arrangements, different intuitions muddle thinking and discourse about rights. Until very recently, these different intuitions in the Western context were primarily prudential ones that resulted from considerations like the role of the state in realizing just social relationships. They resulted in category errors like those detailed above. Given the we that Western nations are now home to growing populations of religious minorities, the differences are increasingly attributable to religious and cultural factors too, which influence perspectives on the proper content of a human right. These differences often present insurmountable impasses to consensus. Most contemporary human rights work, therefore, is focused on interpreting or expanding enumerated lists of recognized rights, irrespective of whether these lists lend themselves to coherent, consistent hermeneutical principles or have a common metaphysical basis rooted in any defensible first principle. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, adopted by the United Nations in 1848, is an example. In many ways, it is a remarkable achievement, but in other ways, it falls far short of being universal in any meaningful sense. An excellent example is Article 18, Freedom of Thought, Conscience, conscience and Religion. The article reads in pertinent part that a person's freedom to change his religion or belief is a protected right, but this phrase proved controversial in that it conflicts with a particular interpretation of Sharia's prohibition against apostasy from Islam. As a result, Saudi Arabia proposed to delete this clause, which was supported by five Muslim-majority member states. Ultimately, the present, article, or the present form of Article 18 was adopted with only one negative vote and 10 abstentions. Further, there was significant controversy regarding how the UDHR would relate to national law the Soviet Union, for example, insisted that this declaration impact on national sovereignty. Accession to the UDHR, therefore, would not signal an intention on the part of the Soviet Union or any other state to alter the content or interpretation of its national laws. The document would not only need to account for religious plurality, 
but also for philosophical and political plurality too. Again, this observation is not focused on the controversies surrounding any specific article of the UDHR. It is merely illustrative of the fact that different parties from different parts of the world conceive of the proper substance of human rights differently. And at best, statements like the UDHR are best understood to be aspirational statements that can more or less guide the work of the United Nations and other international bodies. There was also no clearly defined telos regarding the UDHR. A notable 1968 assessment of the human rights work undertaken internationally notes that, in practice, a claim is an international human right if the United Nations General Assembly says it is. There are many co different competing and conflicting definitional theories that could underlie the UDHR in similar rights statements. The rights claim of the UDHR and other similar statements gain legitimacy, therefore not from reference to inviolable universal principles, but to the authority of a legislative or deliberative organ of a state or governmental body. Political realities, however, all but guarantee that recognition in this way is problematic and political. Regarding the UN, for example, every member state is entitled to a vote in the General Assembly, where votes are subject to the influence of economic and military pressures. Assent or dissent may come at the end of a gun or through the promise of foreign aid that will, at worst, enrich klept kleptocratic leaders or create regional military powers capable of controlling often forgotten corners of the world or at best, bring food and medical supplies to the impoverished. Much more is at stake in the deliberative process of defining human rights by these beings than systematic philosophical consistency or finding common moral ground among the world's great religions. There are those who do not see the phenomenon of rights inflation to be problematic. In fact, they argue that the recognition of ever-increasing numbers of human rights is a positive development in the quest to secure just conditions and freedom for all people. The expansion of the human rights framework continues to prove appealing to new struggles for justice. Indeed, rights inflation is not a sign of a movement going off track, but rather of its continuing relevance and attraction, says one commentator. Still, this sentiment does not address the very real tension between and among various factions involved in human rights work whether they are found in the governmental, non-governmental, or business sectors. Rights inflation translates into practical challenges because the political and social architecture for understanding, describing, and protecting rights has remained unchanged even as what constitutes a right has evolved and expanded. To press a metaphor, the hardware was built with a different software in mind. To understand how a shift in an understanding of the nature of rights impacts the stability and effectiveness of the national form, it is important to understand the evolution of the nation state, especially against other alternatives for organizing political life. It is quite easy for us to take for granted the existence of, quote, the state. In fact, to return to the UDHR, Article 15 incorporates a right to nationality as a basic human right. This would have been a confusing assertion just a few hundred years ago, but the existence of the nation state as the primary, if not the exclusive, modern political form gives rise to the reality that a stateless person lacking citizenship under the laws of any nation has no real prospects for flourishing or even survival. The drafters of the UDHR recognize that nationality brings with it not just essential political protections, but also connections to history and culture. The concept of citizenship and the state took a rudimentary form in ancient times. The Roman ideal of citizenship, which did not encompass all inhabitants and classes in Rome, was a man committed to peace and decency and expected to live in equality with fellow citizens. It was the civil magistrate who was to be the object of the citizen's trust as the one who would defend the dignity of the republic and uphold the laws, as well as to, uh, dispense to each his rights. Of course, these concepts evolved over time, especially with the rise and exception, acceptance of the Christian religion and the Christian church corresponding with the reign of Constantine the Great in the fourth century. St. Augustine's City of God is one of the earliest systematic attempts to reflect on how these concepts morphed. Considering the new religion of the empire and the existence of the church, a new religious institution within it, 
He is writing in the wake of the humiliating fall of Rome in 410 AD and defending Christianity against critics who believed that the newly established religion had disarmed Rome. So whatever shifts in the concepts of the state and the citizen that could be attributable to the Christianization of Rome were then on trial. The city of God is complex and nuanced, so any condensation of its arguments always risks oversimplification. But the, for the purposes of understanding this important juncture in the evolution of the nation state and the concept of citizenship, there is one critical shift to consider. The development of a concept of private and public motivations. The ancient ideal did not consider that a citizen was also an individual with private motives that primarily served his or own, her own interests and not the interests of the state. The great citizen prefers his own city to his life. As noted above, it was the Christian moral claim of the dignity and equality of souls that influenced the political claim of equality of persons and not merely citizens. The implications of this distinction between public and private realms of life are dramatic and pervasive, but a fuller discussion is beyond the present scope. It is sufficient to say that the rise of Christianity resulted in a new concept of citizenship that incorporates the pursuit of both private, personal flourishing with public, collective flourishing. We now understand a citizen to be a right bearer rather than a mere servant of the state fixated narrowly on the state's survival and flourishing. In the Middle Ages, Europe itself was fragmented into hundreds of political units. These political units had overlapping jurisdictions, disputed borders, and very complex networks of connection through familial and political alliances. In short, Europe had little coherence, and social organization varied enormously from one region to another. Europeans understood themselves not as members of a body politic attached to a state, but as lying somewhere along a great chain of being extended from the lowest peasant up through the local lord and then perhaps a prince or a king, then through the emperor, the pope, and finally God. A person's existence and subsistence were dependent upon his, this chain with no reference to citizenship, nationality, or ethnicity other than at the higher strata. Of course, this is again a generalization with various parts of Europe experiencing different types of political and religious changes. However, in the, it is the Protestant Reformation of 1517 that serves as a significant marker on the timeline of the further evolution of the nation state. The Reformation fragmented the Christian church as both a spiritual institution and a political one, and eventually Protestant Roman Catholic powers went to war. A series of interconfessional wars known as the Thirty Years' War came to an end in 1648 through various treaties commonly and collectively known as the Peace of Westphalia. What Westphalia represents is a moment in history when sovereign states emerged as the sole legitimate form of po polity within a society. It was no longer the Holy Roman Empire that was sovereign over Christendom with the power to intervene in local affairs. The Westphalian order then consisted of sovereign states with a viable government and control within its borders and the ability to enter into treaties and committed to non-intervention outside of its own territory. In 1648, there was also a requirement that the states be Christian, but as the Westphalian order began to dominate the wider global system over the following centuries, this was no longer a viable criterion for defining a state. How exactly is the emergence of the Westphalian order significant to a consideration of the nature of human rights and the modern phenomenon of rights inflation? Well, it is only within the context of the nation state that the modern concept of citizenship the concept that recognizes both the private and public aspects of an individual's life and motivations can be realized in any meaningful way. Other forms of political and social organization have weak or non-existent <laughs> notions of citizenship. This conception of citizenship allows the state and the individual full mutual accountability and consists in a web of reciprocal rights and duties upheld by a rule of law which stands higher than any party. This reality is powerful and scalable across the entire jurisdiction of the nation state where every citizen becomes liked to every other by relations which presuppose no personal tie. Citizenship cannot exist, however, outside of the, this concept of mutual accountability. The inhabitants of totalitarian nation states 
with an un unaccountable government do not truly enjoy citizenship, although may be labeled as such by law. They are more properly classified um, as subjects of a state that need not account to the individual. When the rights and duties of the individual are undefined and when there is no rule of law that stands higher than the state that enforces it. Citizenship and the rights that attend it do not necessarily exist in every nation state, but the only place where citizenship exists is in the context of the nation state. The reality is that no perfect system exists, that even within the freest nations there are still ready examples of exploitation and subjection. Both the crux of the entire analysis turns on rights, who possesses them, and how they are protected and enforced. A nation state that is accountable to its citizens cultivates a society of trust. Every citizen is bound by the same rules, and each can expect his or her legally recognized rights to be uh, respected and enforced, but also expects consequences of if he or she ignores or violates a duty that flows from a legitimate right. Problems, however, can arise that will destabilize this trust and erode the society that is contained within a nation state of citizens that are worthy of discussion. Two of these, the presence of non-Christians as Western citizens and a, and a political and social emphasis on individual autonomy are considered below. The practice of faith in nearly all Western nations has declined precipitously in the last generations. The United States, once lagging against the rates of European decline, have been experiencing a steep decline in religious practice according to every measure. But the notion of the Christian West has not and is not dependent upon religious participation. The West is, quote, Christian because of the fundamental ideas that have formed it. The nations of the West bear what French philosopher Pierre Manon refers to, and Tocqueville scholar, refers to as a Christian mark. Specifically, Christian mores have shaped the moral, social, cultural, and political institutions of a nation bearing a Christian mark. This mark shows up in myriad ways, and not just in the private versus public distinctions, in the life of a citizen or in the equality before the law that flows from Christian teaching on the equality of persons before God, as discussed above. A nation in which, quote, all citizens have equal rights is also a nation of a Christian mark. For example, a native-born but secular European can disavow the practice of faith or even the existence of God, but will still have born, been born into and formed in a society with firm roots in a Christian tradition. Secularization does not neutralize society regarding religion. This is not the case for a non-Christian immigrant entering into a Western nation. At present, he's likely, most likely a practicing Muslim from a majority Muslim nation in North Africa or the Middle East. Can Muslims be citizens more than in the, just the technical sense of the word? The answer is, of course. The most recent decade of European history suggests that there are significant challenges, however, in granting a place in Christian society to a form of life which Christianity has never mixed on equal footing. However, the principles upon which the nation state is formed do not require a religious test before granting citizenship status to as citizen status as right holders. A status that is inherent in citizenship itself. Let me read that. Uh, let me, I screwed up that sentence, sorry. The nation state is, is formed, as formed, do not require a religious test before granting citizens status as rights holders. That's a status that is inherent to citizenship itself. And these principles do not ex exempt any citizen from bearing the duties imposed by the legitimate rights of fellow citizens. The success of the integration of Muslims and other non-Christians into Western nations depends on the ability of these groups to be free to form distinct communities in the nation in which they are all citizens, like every other person, but within a surrounding community that everyone knows and acknowledges is not explicitly non-Christian. This is clearly an ideal more easily articulated than realized. It is important to note at this point that it is not the fact of citizenship or some other type of membership in a political community that confers rights on the individual. The concept of rights is a legal form that translates a thing about a person into something politically actionable. Rights are, as noted above, 
personal and individuated. It is the ontological dignity of the individual from which the legal rights spring. However, individuals are members of communities, which is why the classical conception of rights implies a consideration of other individuals in the community. The shift that Tocqueville argued against in 1848 was one that involves the state's adoption of concern about social welfare within its purview. This altered the relationship between the individual and the state and made the state the guarantor of certain social conditions rather than the guarantor of the right action associated with the legitimate rights of citizens as right bearers. This has two important effects. First, every claim that is treated as a right imposes a duty on others. When the state takes on the obligation of guaranteeing social conditions, then it also takes on the task of guaranteeing that others bear the duties that realizing that end requires. There are myriad examples of this about which much ink has been spilled. A recognized right to internet access imposes a duty on others to provide it. A recognized right to education provide, imposes a duty on others to provide it. There are more onerous examples too that may directly impinge upon the conscience of others and create a duty in conflict with legitimate right claims that are already vested in other citizens. A right to procure an abortion can translate into a duty assigned to someone to perform one, and a right to self-determination of one's gender can translate into others being compelled to speak or otherwise act in ways that affirm this. Second, this shift is one that centers the citizen as an individual and is only concerned with the private aspect of individual life and leaves behind the public aspect that was formerly the sole concern of pre-Christian Roman citizenship. In short, it is predicated upon and advances the fiction of human autonomy. To be autonomous requires that there is no distinction between two qualitatively different actions, the action to command and the action to obey. Because are, these are two different but corollary actions, they require different agents who stand differently in relation to the action. The one who commands be, uh, begins an action, and the one who obeys pursues the action. One conceives of an action and acts to communicate that conception, while the other acts according to how that conception is communicated. No one agent can do both of these things. More simply, human beings live in communities upon which they depend not only for their specific ambitions and goals, but also for their very language with which to describe and intend them. A command to act, the comprehension of that command, an articulation of self-identity, or even an expression of preferences depend upon the existence of a community to make it intelligible even within the mind of an individual. The unlimited sovereignty of individual rights, as Pierre Manon calls it, um, in the resulting state of affairs that follows from this shift that, uh, that opposed by Tocqueville, has flooded society not only with legally recognized rights, but with legally binding duties. It has condoned acceptance of the benefits without accepting the corresponding personal and civic obligations of living in a democratic society. Rights come into conflict when the legally recognized duties associated with one right conflict with other legitimate and sometimes recognized rights. Such a situation requires the compromise of one right or the other, and in the case when a legitimate right gives way to a spurious but legally recognized one, the obligatory action may be one that transgresses the moral convictions of the duty bearer. Compliance with the law, therefore, may require betraying one's conscience. This state of affairs has also created an unanswerable argument for anyone who wants to prevail against the rules and meaning of any institution whatsoever. The proliferation of rights rob essential institutions of their meaning and substance. By subjecting the authority inherent in the, in the institution, whether it be the church, the family, the university, or the state, to the radical autonomy of the individual, these very institutions are the little platoons, the smaller communities organized around a lesser common good that is oriented toward the greater common good of the national community in which citizens can cooperate toward common political, social, or economic ends. But it also can lead to an arbitrary practical recognition of rights. Some rights are favored over others, and those are the ones enforced by courts. Citizens in such a society no longer enjoy the social and political benefits that come with a common and consistent scope of the law and their rights under it. 
Namely, this is a society in which trust erodes between citizens. This loss of trust runs through all institutions, all the way up to the nation state itself. And as trust erodes, other means of ensuring social stability is required. And citizens begin to morph into subjects of the state. Paradoxically, the project that began to expand rights to address justice then leads to a loss of liberty and new injustices. Human rights are a fundamental building block of any social and political arrangement because they help to define the relationships between members of any given community. But to do so in a way that contributes to the common good and the stability of flourishing of society Rights claims must be properly understood as individuated and affecting more than just the claimant to a right. What claims, that are not, uh, what claims that are not rights are legally recognized as such, or when the state recognizes rights in the pursuit of ends outside of its proper purview, there is no natural terminus regarding what can be legally recognized as a right and enforces such. The political form of the nation state evolved along with and assumed the classical conception of rights as a three-term relation involving more than just the right holder. And the understanding has been compromised through the rise of individual autonomy and the proliferation of rights that followed. It would be dramatic to say that the, civil, the survival of civilization requires a return to cl a classical understanding of rights and the citizen is not merely an individual, but also as a member of a community. But without such a return, the trust that has been cultivated between citizens who are equal under the law, which is only realizable in the context of the political form of the nation state will erode and leave space for the necessary rise of other means of maintaining social order and cohesion. Thank you. <laughs>